Hi, my name is Michael Straka. I'm a cryptographer working at C Labs on Scylla, and today I'm going to be talking about Plumo, which is a snark based light client that we've been working on for Scylla. This is joint work with Cy Vesely, Kobe Gherkin, Ario Gabazon, Philip Jovanovic, Georgios Konstantopoulos, Asa Owens, Merrick Olszewski, and Iran Tromer. So what is Celo? Celo is a blockchain platform. It is a permissionless platform that makes financial tools accessible to anyone with a mobile phone. So lots of people have mobile phones. They're important. They're here to stay. How can we make blockchain technology permissionless finance accessible to these people? Well, imagine for a moment that blockchain tech is as accessible as Venmo. You just enter in someone's name, phone number, type it in, and then send them money. It's in a way that's simple, anyone can do. How do we achieve this? In another application, the same problem, verifying the integrity of on-chain data efficiently is CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. A lot of countries are exploring right now. And if you're making one of those, it's a private network, you might want to verify the integrity of a public blockchain, the data on there. So if you can do that efficiently, you can also verify the data efficiently on a mobile phone. Very related problems. How can we make both of these efficient? Well, this raises a preliminary question, which is, are blockchains already efficient on mobile phones? And the answer is no. Bitcoin takes, at least not, not natively, Bitcoin's about 400 gigabytes, Ethereum's about 600 gigabytes. This is pretty large. You're, you're not going to go through all that on your smartphone. Uh, most people aren't even going to go through all that on their desktop. So we need to find a way to verify this data more efficiently than just a naive, obvious manner. So there's one solution for this called simple payment verification, also called SPV. Uh, it's proposed by Satoshi Nakamoto in the original Bitcoin white paper, 2008. And the idea is that as Bitcoin is proof of work, you can just verify the proof of work hashes, verify their integrity in the block headers one by one. And just if you want to verify a transaction, you get the Merkle inclusion proof of that transaction and verify that. And if you do this, it's, it's a lot less data. Bitcoin's uh, tens of megabytes, Ethereum, handful of gigabytes. But it's still, you know, especially if you're in an area where data is uh, a bit expensive, it's more constrained, and it's true in a lot of places. Uh, but still, even the tens of megabytes can be prohibitive, and we want to bring that down. What's some related work tackling the same problem? Well, one is a NEPOPOW, it's a non-interactive proof, proof of work, it uses statistical properties of block headers and proof of work to uh, give certain guarantees. It doesn't generalize to proof of stake though, which is our setting with Celo. Extension of this is Fly Client. There's also Mina, which is a very interesting project. They build what uh, what they call a succinct blockchain. So you can verify the entire chain state in a single snark proof. But to do this, you need to arithmetize your entire consensus protocol. So you need to make sure it's computable efficiently with uh, finite field operations, addition and multiplication, modulo some, uh, some value. And this is not only complex in terms of the engineering, but you also have to be very careful not to limit your design space. 
uh, with things such as smart contract functionality, which of course is being worked on, but it's difficult. And then there's also Halo 2, which is being worked on by the Electric Coin Company. And the idea here is to use what's essentially a recursive variant of Bulletproofs, which is a interactive proof protocol which doesn't have a setup, uh, which is good because you don't have to do a setup. It's quite, quite time consuming. And, but, you know, because of this, the prover and verifier are going to be linear in the circuit size. That's you know, intuitively, they each need to read in the circuit because they're not given a succinct description, which is what the setup gives you. So it's a little bit less efficient in that regard. Uh, and they also use a UTXO instead of an account-based model, which is also a different setting from the one that we're working with. So that was Pluma work. Well, first we need to understand the context that we're working in, which is Acello's proof of stake algorithm. And essentially how this works is you have a set of validators, say 100. Uh, a proposer each round is randomly selected to propose a block. The rest sign it if it looks valid, if at least two thirds, a two thirds quorum signs. So in this case, at least 67. The block is approved and inserted in the chain. And then each epoch, in our case a day, uh, we have a validator election. And anyone can lock their silo to vote on a validator group to be elected. Validators with the most groups become the next validators. And then the epoch block, which is generated once a day, records the difference of the validator set, which is generated in this manner. And the, the difference is represented by their public keys, of course, which are used to verify the integrity of, of the chain. So we could uh, think of a basic light client analogous to the Bitcoin SPV design, where you just iterate over each epoch block, check that at least two-thirds of validators signed it, and then you update the validator set based on that diff until you reconstructed the current validator set. And then if you want to know a specific transaction, you go to the block it's contained in, check the Merkle inclusion proof, and check that that block is signed, it's been approved by the validator set at that point. Pretty simple. Uh, we want to do better than this, even. So, Pluma uses the epoch-based syncing that I have just described. We optimize a subset of our consensus protocol. In this case, we use BLS signatures uh, for com computation inside of an arithmetic circuit. And this is good because uh, with BLS, you can condense any number of signatures over the same message into one signature. So you verify 100 signatures over the same message and it's the same cost as the, uh, the original. It's just one signature. Just pretty neat. And then, of course, we condense all this in a snark. Uh, in our case, we use Groth16 for this. So. Fundamentally, there's two ways you could do this. One is to do it recursively. Uh, here, pies are proofs, r is an NP relation, should be a set. I represented it as a function. Uh, abusive notation, but it's fine. The x's are public inputs. That's what the prover and verifier needs. W's are private inputs. Only the prover has access to that. So we put most of the data in the private inputs. The verifier doesn't need it. The x's are just the hashes, respectively, of the first and last epoch blocks of you know, the data in each proof. And then we condense four months of data in each proof. Uh, so we could do this recursively. Uh, pi zero here would verify 
first four months of data, pi 1 verifies the next four months in addition to pi 0. So you get eight months of data with one proof, which is pretty neat. And then you can keep doing that ad infinitum. So you get to the current proof, pi n, which verifies all the previous proofs as well, plus four more months of data. Or you could take a simpler approach in terms of engineering complexity, which I've turned the inductive approach, but technically the recursive approach is also inductive because it's going in a line. It's just, just a cute name for it. Uh, but this is also, in a sense, inductive. Again, because it goes in a line. And in this case, each proof is independent. Pi 0 verifies the first four months of data, pi 1 the next four months, and so on. And t here is just a function that links them together. In our case, it will check the last epoch, the hash of the last epoch of the previous proof is identical to the hash of the first epoch of the next proof. So it kind of guarantees that they're chained together. Uh, should note in our paper, we formalize this a bit differently. We have a more sophisticated model that sort of gives a blueprint for how you, how you can construct your own snark-based light client. Uh, so if that's exciting to you, recommend checking that out. We're not going to go into detail here because it's we're short on time. Uh, so in this case, just verify one proof for every four months. And you're good to go. Uh, now why did we go with this over the recursive approach? Well, generally when you're engineering this kind of system, it's best to only use as many tools as you need. In our case, we're verifying four months of data in a growth 16 proof, which is, you can verify in a fraction of a second. It's three proofs per year. That's it's not that bad. Now, 20, 30 years from now, if Plumo's still going, recursive approach is going to be a lot more appealing. We're not at that point yet. Uh, and then also, with our choice of snark with Groth 16, uh, chose that based on a similar philosophy. Went with a system that's a little bit older, a little bit better studied. Um, which is not to say that newer ones are necessarily unsafe. They probably are fun, but we decided to err a little bit more on the side of caution than most blockchain projects. Not that that's always going to be the ideal point in the design space trade-off that you want to be in, but that's, uh, that's what we chose to go with. So what what does our snark circuit look like? So first, what are we proving per epoch? And like I said, we chain 120 epochs into each proof, but for each epoch, we're going to check that the aggregate public key was, uh, was formed from at least uh, two-thirds quorum. Again, BLS signatures, you just add the keys together, you add the signatures together, you get one public key, one signature, and they verify. It's beautiful. Then we check the epoch message number is one greater than the last. So we form sort of a chain. It's like a counter that you increment. Uh, we have a neat trick here for to prevent future committee attacks, uh, where you guess in advance what the validator set will be, and then you pre you know pre-sign with those keys after you've breached them uh, a future block. Uh, and we prevent this by including a chain of entropy values as well in the epoch blocks. Which is maybe this is an unlikely attack, but we have protection against it. And then, of course, we check that the multi-signature in the epoch is valid. Now, when we chain multiple epochs together, we do the same thing, but we also, instead of checking each multi-signature individually, we check an aggregate multi-signature, basically verify a bunch at the same time over different messages and uh, this reduces the amount of pairings you need to check in verification. You can't get it down to one pairing but you can reduce the amount that you need to compute. And then of course we also check that the public input is valid. I'll use Blake two hashes for those to minimize client computation. Uh, client here being a mobile phone user. 
uh, because most circuit friendly hashes are, you know, they're less efficient outside of a circuit. So what do we do inside circuits? Well, we do BLS verification. This is an equality of pairing checks. Now, when you're doing elliptic curve computations inside of an arithmetic circuit, you have two fields to worry about. There's a scalar field of your curve, and then there's the base field. The scalar curve, you divide them, uh, a stark over an elliptic curve, you wanted to be doing prover and verifier operations in the scalar field. Uh, or in the exponent of your group elements. And if you're doing elliptic curve operations in that, you know, those reduce down to the base field of your curve that you're doing them in. So you're trying to do operations in a base field in a scalar field. And if those two, the modulus of those two finite fields doesn't match up, you're going to have a bad time because you're going to need to simulate that finite field arithmetic with a different finite field. You want to avoid that. It's very costly. So one way of doing this is to use a two chain. We have uh, these BLS 12.377 taken from the Zexi paper, uh, and then BW6, uh, which is from a paper by uh, Riyad Wabi and Dan Bonet. And essentially the scalar field of BW6 is identical to the base field of 377. So you can do 377 operations in an arithmetic circuit defined over BW6. Uh, this is, works out great. And this is what we do. We define our snark over BW6 and we do our signature scheme over 377. And then we do those the BLS verification in the EW6 circuit. Here we have some bit sizes. Uh, we choose public keys for 377 and G1. It's to minimize on-chain data. It's smaller than G2. Then another design consideration is the hash, fun hash function. Again, we chose to use primitives that are a little bit older, a little bit better studied. There's some amazing arithmetic hashes being developed, like Poseidon and Mimsy. These are great. Uh, haven't been around as long as traditional hashes. You can only know that they're a hash in cryptography is secure through extended cryptanalysis. Uh, they're probably fine, but we chose to go with something a little bit better studied. Uh, and we used it Blake 2x for our hash. But of course, Bitwise hashes are expensive in circuits, to, so to make this more, uh, to make this cheaper, we first compute a Peterson hash, Bauhopward Peterson hash. This is the basic version here. Each x i is a bit value. You use it to multiply generators together to get a value. Here we get an intermediate value y, which reduces the input to h here, which is blit 2x. So it's a little less expensive bitwise hash. And then we get our output Z, because the Peterson output is not pseudo-random, even though it's collision resistant. Here, the output of Blake 2x is pseudo-random, which is what we want for BLS signatures. Uh, and then we do this using, essentially try and increment, you just hash a counter as well and see if your result can be interpreted as a valid curve point. If not, you increment the counter and try again. And you can, you can do this inside a circuit because you just pass in the nonce. As part of your private inputs, right? It's circuits are it's essentially a non-deterministic computation model. You you can do essentially guess and check would be an intuitive way of framing it. So here are some constraint costs. Uh they're pretty reasonable. Uh Blake 2x is expensive as expected, but not too bad. It's less than it could be. And again, we only do it once per epoch, so it's not not terrible. Uh, but ultimately, our circuit is quite large. It's over 60 million constraints. We had a setup with over 100 participants across both phase, phases. There's some repeats between the phases. Uh, so generating this randomness for this setup takes close to a day per participant. Uh, even if you have a decent machine, that's quite expensive. 
If we do this normally, you just pipe each one person runs it one at a time, passes the result on to the next individual, and they keep going. That's it's about 100 days. That's uh, it's quite a well, a lot of logistics. So how can we do better? Well, in a we do what we have termed optimistic out-of-order execution, also known as optimistic pipelining. The uh, idea was coined by Justin Drake in an ETH research forum post. And the idea is that but we've, as far as I know, are the first people to have implemented this and put it into production. Uh, the idea is instead of you know, piping each thing linearly, do the setup in rounds, pass the result of each round to the next round. And you can have practically about 10 people per round. You know, if one person's machine goes down, you have to start over. Or, you know, the space radiation corrupts their hard drive. Uh, so, you know, you, you don't want that number to go too high. Although, in practice, you can do as many people as you want per round. In our case, it takes about a day per round. So, we got going from 100 days to about 9 days of active computation per phase. It's a pretty good improvement. Uh, so when you're generating this randomness, it's just, you know, each participant multiplies the result by their own random value to get the final random value, in this case alpha and delta. Uh, and if you represent the standard way of doing this, it's, yeah, each person just pipes the result onto the next one. And they just keep going until you get a result. It's an optimistic model. You have it round, where there's a lot going on in this diagram, but it's actually pretty simple. Each person just takes a randomness from the pool. In practice, it would be a vector, a collection of random elements. You know, it's way more efficient. It doesn't take that long to multiply one element. Uh, and then returns the result back to the pool. So you can have each person working on their own set of random values simultaneously. It's, it's a lot more efficient. And then you can chain these rounds together to get your final result. This is what we've done. It worked great. Uh, highly recommend looking into this if you yourself are doing a setup with a large circuit. We also have some code for this, uh, which I've linked to at the end, which you might be interested in. So what's our performance like? Well, to generate a proof takes about under an hour. We're doing 120 epochs with 100 validators, about 2,500 seconds, uh, which for generating these every four months is not too bad. It takes up a lot of memory, about 500 gigabytes of RAM in our case. But, uh, you know, let's rent, let's go to Google Cloud, rent the biggest machine you can find. Like in our case, we literally rented the biggest machine we could find uh, and run it for an hour and do that every four months. And then constraints are about 60 million. We have a neat graph here. If you're interested in you know, how that scales with number of validators or number of epochs. Verification, mobile phones, tested it on a few phones. Uh, most it's pretty fast, under a second. Can get uh, you know, a bit expensive with uh, really old phones, but of course it's still better. It's gonna be it's a lot worse if you don't use a snark for to verify the same data. So if anything, the the slower times are an argument for for using this kind of system. Uh, and then here, we have some of our code linked. If you'd like to check any of it out, we have our circuit implementation implemented over Arcworks. It's a neat library in Rust for uh, circuit computations and various elliptic curves. And then uh, we also have our optimistic setup implementation in three repos. Snark setups the basic math, operator and coordinator are more the uh, coordination code. Oh, that's all I have for today. Appreciate you taking the time to watch this, and hope you all have a wonderful day.